on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. The final episode. Is Wild Fed going to be enough for you? Is that going to be like a big enough outlet? We are continuing to tell these stories via the TV show, but we're going to be shutting down the podcast, starting a new podcast where we can explore more ideas. It's important for people to at least try to do this type of thing because it's been in our DNA since we've been human. I'm concerned that we'll see laws in the foraging side. Part of me doesn't like it at all. At the same time, Part of me loves the idea because it would enshrine, allow it to take place in perpetuity. Learn one new species a year. And if you keep doing that, all of a sudden, I have a relationship now with the natural world. I'm just hoping that this show lives on as a resource to people. The boomers will start to age out of hunting. My generation will inherit it. We're a lot smaller hunting population. Millennials will start taking it over. And then it's Gen Z. So I just think it's important that somebody remembers how to hunt and gather. <laughs> Episode 174 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Conclusions, the final episode, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Man, I'm excited to introduce a new product at SirThrival.com. We've teamed up with Hammond's Black Walnuts, and after a year of behind-the-scenes work, I'm proud to finally introduce Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder. This is the most exciting new product I've seen in my 15 years in the health food and nutritional supplement industry. I've been using it for over six months every morning in my smoothie and loving it more each day. It fortifies my blended drinks with 17 grams of wild protein per scoop. But the story is even more incredible because the black walnuts in our protein powder are hand foraged from wild native trees. There's no fertilizer, no irrigation, no pesticides used anywhere in the process. No agricultural land is used either, so no habitat is disrupted to produce these nuts. All the foragers are volunteers paid by the pound for their harvests. In other words, when you invest in Sir Thrival's black walnut protein powder, it's not just an investment in your health. You're investing in wild lands, wild species, healthy ecosystems, and the people who tend to them. I can honestly say it's hands down the most ethically sourced and produced protein product ever made. It's also the cleanest because we use the same ultra pure CO2 extraction process used in high end cannabis extracts. This yields a light colored raw protein powder far superior to the ones made with higher heat expeller pressing. It's a very fine flour too, so we've used it in more than just smoothies. My wife's been baking it into cookies and muffins, turning them into wild protein fortified snacks and she uses it in her oatmeal at breakfast too. I'm excited to see all the recipes you come up with using this really versatile ingredient. Wild North American native trees, 100% grown and processed in the USA. Sometimes it feels too good to be true. We've managed to bring a wild hand foraged native North American food to people in a format they can easily use to fortify their diets daily. Head over to SirThrival.com to check out the entire product line and use the coupon code WILDFED to get an additional 5% off your order. Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder, the first wild protein powder on the market ever. Do you need an antidote to the metaverse? We just launched our newest t-shirt design over at wild-fed.com. It features our antidote to the metaverse tagline on the chest, a wild fed badge on the sleeve, and two tarot style cards juxtaposed on the back, one modeled on the tarot card known as the fool, who's wearing an oculus and absentmindedly walking off the roof of a building with a bag of fast food in one hand and a cell phone in the other. Next to it is a card based on the magician who's juggling four implements, a fishing rod, a rifle, a trap, and a foraging basket. It represents our belief that a life that includes the outdoors inoculates you against believing that an artificial experience of life could ever replace a natural one. You see, for us, being wild-fed, hunting, fishing, and foraging is about a lot more than just getting our groceries. It's an antidote to the metaverse, an act of rebellion against the transhuman agenda that is leading humanity to abandon the natural world in favor of wearing screens over their eyes to live in a virtual one. We choose the natural over the artificial. We choose an antidote to the metaverse. We choose to be fed by the wild. Check out our new shirt at wild-fed.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. 
Welcome, everybody, to the final episode of The Wild... I say that with like a tear in my eye, Grant. It's a little sad. The final episode of The Wild Fed Podcast, episode 174. Mm -hmm. We go back to uh, episode one at November 12th, 2019. Before wow, the world 2019? Changed. Before the world changed. Wow. Doesn't feel like it's been that long. November of 2019. So it was like just before all of the kind of crazy began, right? Because that was like late 2019. You started hearing rumors of it. Anyway, so we've been, we went through the, the great change together. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for everybody listening, yeah, this is our final episode. We are uh, wrapping it up. Now, I want to be really clear that we're not... Um, concluding the television show so we're just about to go into production on season four mm -hmm. of wild fed on the outdoor channel which is exciting and we have a really great season shaping up uh, in fact we'll start filming in the next few weeks it looks like yep and a um, little teaser about where we're headed with that but we're gonna finally get to uh, work on the glass eel story yeah the american eel story yeah so the american eel for those of you who don't know um probably have heard about this but they breed in what what scientists believe is happening is that the eels are breeding in the sargasso sea which is sort of uh where like the um bermuda triangle is and uh they think that the adult eels leave fresh water down through rivers and streams well we know they do that head out to the atlantic make their way down you know, toward the Caribbean, out to the Bermuda Triangle area and the Sargasso Sea. But this is where we lose them. We don't really know for sure. But then what happens they is their larva... They think that's where they're mating in the Sargasso Sea? Yeah. And that they... There have been artistic renderings of what people imagine a giant writhing, you know, <laughs> eel orgy would look like down there. Oh, yeah. Right? I know. <laughs> so this is really fascinating. These are catadromous fish, so opposite of anadromous fish. So we've done a bunch around salmon and um, got to, you know, be face to face with some of those salmon up in uh, Canada. Vibes yeah, the ale vibes, the ale wives that are uh, come up our rivers, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so these are fish that live out in the salt and then come into the fresh, but the eels live in the fresh. They go out to the salt to spawn. So kind of opposite. So catadromous. And uh, anyway, when they're um, larva, they, they basically just follow the ocean currents and they hit the Eastern seaboard up in Maine um, and get kind of deposited all along the, the shoreline. And they start to work their way up into fresh water. I mean, they're like what an inch and a half long or so mm -hmm. clear yeah. little miniature eels and they climb their way over rocks and they make their way up dams and they work their way through waterfalls and, and then eventually infiltrate, um, you know, inland into kind of like, Lakes and rivers and ponds. Yeah, but like a lot of like shallow water too mm -hmm. and muddy stuff. And anyway, like they can kind of like pe people say they can crawl over land a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I don't know. I, it'll be interesting to follow that up. I've, yeah. I've heard that, but I don't, okay. I don't know if that's actually true. But what one thing I've heard is that they can follow seams of water underground mm -hmm. through, you know, what would otherwise be considered land, but has like water percolating through right. it. And they can kind of make their way through those seams to get into places that would seem like unreachable. But anyway, um, when they hit the Eastern seaboard, what's been going on for a long time is this, um, there was this illegal fishery or this unregulated fishery, I should say, where people would capture the young eels called glass eels. And then they would sell them at extremely high prices over to Asia. Do you know like what the prices were per pound? I think they were a couple thousand bucks and it was like a cash business. Yeah. And, um, they would go get sent over, uh, to Asia to be raised into adult eels and then sold as unagi into the sushi market. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a woman in Maine who has figured out, because only two states, I think it's us, and I want to say it's North Carolina is the other state, where you can still um, harvest glass eels, but they have a smaller fishery than us. So it's just two states that do this. Now it's very regulated, and it's become a controlled f fishery. But Still good money for doing it, I think. Still though, right? really good money for doing it, yeah. Uh, so there's a woman we're going to be working with in Maine who's called American Unagis for business. She's raising glass eels so to cool. adulthood here. And that way... Keeping they, them here. Keeping them here and then selling them into the market here in the U.S. so that there's not the shipping over. Because that's one of the things. When you get unagi at a sushi place, you're getting a wild fish. 
but you're getting a wild fish that's been raised in captivity. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating, you know? So anyway, uh, keeping it local is pretty cool. So we're going to go uh, out there and, and check out that fishery, which is really cool because it's kind of a difficult thing to penetrate. I believe they sell quotas for the fishermen. It's v it's a closed system. Like mm -hmm. it's not easy to penetrate they're, into that world. They were talking about a credit card system that they have. So like For the sales. E yeah, but like every eel is accounted for. Or not every eel, but every pound of right. every, all the weight is accounted for. So every all unagi is glass eel that's been raised in captivity and then sold oh, into the market that's a good question there might be exceptions to that but i but primarily at least i, I don't that's a great question i don't know the, the answer to that because i don't know if any of new zealand's eels end up in right. there or if any or like ray eels. turner like he he sells his eels when they're coming down right he, he, they're but he, going you remember back he wouldn't see. like sell us a live so one at a time he sells smoked oh, right. eel yeah, already yeah. processed mm -hmm. like yeah so that's not going into unagi so yeah, I don't, I don't know, like, what percentage of adults. I'm excited to see this. Like, well, I, I wonder know. what they eat and everything. Like, yeah, I know. It's going to be fascinating. So, anyway, the point is uh, we are continuing to uh, tell these stories via the TV show. Uh, but we're going to be shutting down the podcast. Now, here's the thing. Uh, two, two things going on. Internally at WildFed, we've been talking about this for a while. Yeah. This all began before the podcast began when you said famously to me, before Remember? Wild Fed began at all, or we were just starting Wild Fed, or, so, or maybe you told me about the idea to start it. And you famously said to me, I was like, is this enough for you, Daniel? <laughs> is Wild Fed going to be enough for you? Is that going to be like a big enough outlet? Yeah. Uh, which was, um, uh, that's resonated in my head for years because uh, I have obviously a lot of other interests besides just this, like one of the slices of my pie chart yeah. of interest. And I'm a vocal character, so... <laughs> <laughs> So over the years, yeah, because uh, we, so going back to 2019, it's 2023, so I guess we've been at this for three and a half years or so, um, and uh, over the years, I have started to feel like I, I want to talk about more things. So we've been talking internally about starting a new podcast at some point, undetermined point in the future, a podcast that's a, just a more broad, general Daniel Vitalis podcast, mm -hmm. um, where we can explore more ideas. And so to give you a sort of sense of some of that, I mean, I'm very interested in nutrition obviously that's a big piece which we get to touch on a lot here on the show but it's yeah. sort of periphery to wild foods mm -hmm. um, so nutrition's a big interest of mine fitness a big interest of mine physiology anatomy uh, sexuality marriage love um, current events politics just like a million things yeah. that i want to touch on and a lot of the things that because sometimes we stray a little bit off of our um theme here on the show too because i'm really interested in anthropology and mm -hmm. archaeology particularly like um the paleolithic era and stuff like that so i love talking to people in that field so uh i just have like a psychology another big area of interest of mine um childhood trauma another big area of interest of mine and so there's just like all these things that i want to uh kind of get into um so we've been talking about doing that for a while um but we've been enjoying doing this and so there's like uh, not been a lot of impetus and then um, Jesse, who is our other producer. Don't say it. I know. This is really hard to say out loud. But uh, I've worked with her, I want to say 10 years, but it's probably actually been longer now. Um, but Jesse and I, you know, Jesse and I started the Rewild Yourself podcast together way back in the day for people who've been following along with me since back then. Um, she and I did uh, the magazine Rewild Yourself together. I mean, she's she's been... Um, my partner in all of these projects for over a decade and uh she's uh has a baby at home and she's ready to move on to being a more full-time mom which is like i'm super excited for her mm -hmm. but also like wow how how will we do this <laughs> With, <laughs> without her she's she's played a, an incredibly instrumental role um, not just in the podcast, but also in the TV show and all these other areas. She also works with me at Survival, So she's just been this like really key player in everything that I've been doing for a while. So uh, with her getting ready to move on, uh, we've decided this is a great time. We know we want to change the podcast uh, to a different format anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's a good time to take a little downtime, um, let things settle out before we start something up. But um, thankfully, Grant and I uh, are going to continue on uh, making the TV show and then yeah. eventually... Uh, working together on another podcast, which is exciting. So we'll keep you informed. Um, stay on our uh, mailing list. And or if you're not on it, get on it. That way um, you'll know when we start something else up. And um, 
And if you're subscribed to the show, just stay subscribed because we'll put something out to let you know, you yeah. know when the next show starts up. But, yeah. uh, and uh, congratulations, Jesse. It's going to be, uh, obviously, I'm, we're going to stay in touch and, you know, all of that. But, I mean, I'm just. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Sad to see her go um, after all these years, but also happy for her. So, um, that said, we're 174 episodes deep. And I want to say this, too. If you've um, somehow landed on this episode and you're new to the show, uh, go back to the beginning because it's been quite a journey. We've learned a lot. I mean, I came into this pretty new to... Um, I'd been interested in wild foods for a really long time. I had some experience um, practically, but more of it was almost academic in a sense. And this show really, I think, probably picked up a couple years after I started hunting and fishing a little more seriously. Um, But this really tracks my journey. So I want to say my hopes for the posterity of this show is that we have done a good job of curating voices from all over wild foods from people who hunt and people who fish and people who forage. And then, um, also people who work with those foods and cook with those foods and, um, and study those foods. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Particularly that well said, because a lot of the people we've spoken to have been in wildlife management, uh, in, um, regulation, um, science. Yep. In the sciences. So we've spoken to quite a broad range of voices. We've tried to curate also, conversations with the people who are the more of the influencer side and then the people who are more on the um, policy side too. So there's, yeah, 174 episodes. So I'm just hoping that this show lives on as a resource to people. That's what I always wanted it to be anyway, because when I first kind of got excited about wild food in a more significant way, I, well, you've seen Grant, like when I get interested in a topic, like it's, it's almost pathological, the degree to which I'll immerse myself in every aspect. Yeah, of nobody it. bring up, bring up CrossFit around <laughs> Daniel right now. <laughs> I go deep on the things that I get interested yeah. in and, and I go all the way. And, which um, is a really cool quality. I'm sure it's a, a little hard to live with. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my <laughs> wife is a very, uh, adaptable person. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's probably kind of intense. It's a whirlwind anyway. So, Um, but I, but it's a learning method. It's like a, it's almost like a Tim Ferriss type learning method, you know, where it's like deep immersion, learn everything I can as quickly as possible. Not out of like some, uh, it's not like some program or system I follow. That's one of the things I've noticed in the influencer market is somebody is like that. And then they promote that thing. And then it starts to look like it's strategic It's like this with business, like where um, it looks like somebody had this idea to like Jeff Bezos had this idea to build Amazon into what it is. It's like, probably not. Probably was was like step by step step and things happen and you take advantage of opportunities. And then at the end, you write a book about how you built it. But it's like, that's, that's the postscript to the whole story. It's not like how it actually happened. Like it wasn't with a plan. So uh, I don't follow some kind of like adult learning system. It's just like how I'm wired, but I, I go deep and this podcast really charts and tracks that whole experience, my whole learning journey um, around wild foods, um, which kind of started from an interest I've had in nutrition forever, but, uh, but also growing up a kid who just didn't have all the food around that I wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, I've always taken an interest in like what to feed myself. And so it's like a little bit of childhood traumas in the story here. And then um, also because I I have this like nagging apocalyptic mentality that, you know, is like partially from that trauma, partially from the state of the world. (laughs) Yeah, watching the state of the world, uh, but also just a personality quirk Mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, like I try to trying to be remote to that these days and not like get so not like feed that dog too much you know, cause it's like, can be kind of unhealthy, but, um, but I've always had like a survivalist kind of mentality and it's been like, Hey, I'd love to have the, I think a lot of people probably, probably especially a lot of men, but a lot of people have this desire to know how to feed themselves and their family off the landscape. And I just decided like, okay, well I'm just going to go into it. Really fully. do it. Yeah. Yeah. Really do it. And, um, do it in a way that I think it's almost like, uh, because I've been invited on to like, you know, the, those TV shows that are you know, naked and afraid and yeah, alone. Kind of stuff. And stuff I've never like been that. invited on alone. I don't think I've ever. Well, have I been in? I thought you. I think no, you naked and afraid a bunch of times. But uh, alone, I, I hold alone is like in like a special esteem. So I think I, I would remember that one. But um, anyway, uh, I'm not one of those people. 
You know, I don't have like that. I, I my thing has been how f- how much can you feed yourself this way and still be like a normal person? Because mm-hmm. if you want to go on a loan, you're kind of like. Grant, you know, it's like CrossFit. <laughs> if you wanted to go be on the CrossFit Games today, like 10 years ago is different, but today, you got to be a full time yeah. athlete. Every second of your day is scheduled. Every amount, everything you eat is weighed. It's like, you know, if you want to play a sport at the highest level, you got to be, that's your whole full time life. I think if you want to be like on a loan, you got to be one of those people who like, this weekend you're you're going to be living in a debris hut you know mm-hmm. and you're going to be like making cordage to try to catch a fish on a, like a bone hook or something that's like your day uh, that's not my weekend to this weekend so so i've never been one of those people so it's been more like how do i um how much of this is possible for a more regular person mm-hmm. you know that's been more what i've been interested in and it's like a practice yeah as a practice exactly like a person who does yoga and meditation but also has like a full time job yeah or my wife always calls it, um, she gets this from the Osho tradition, but it's like um, the person who still participates in the marketplace, like not the monk who lives in the cave. On top of the mountain. Full yeah. respect for that. Mm-hmm. Like nothing but respect for that. But if everybody did that, there'd be no continuation of the world. Right? right. So it's like there still needs to be the people who turn wrenches and stuff. It'd be great if those people can meditate too. So mm-hmm. similarly, it's like, can I fill my freezer and refrigerator and kitchen up with these foods? And we found out that yes, you can also found out it's a, it's a, as a practice, you, it's a lot of work. It's a yeah. massive amount of work and, yeah. um, but a very rewarding. So that's kind of always been the theme since the beginning. And, um, if you want to know how to do that and you haven't followed along with this show, like go back through because we really lay out how to do it. But, um, but in the end, I think these are like really awesome life skills to have. I think so too. You've um, you've been in an interesting position, Grant, because you've spent more time shooting with the camera. The, obviously, you get to do some of these hunts and participate in the foraging and a lot of it, but you've been documenting it. Mm-hmm. But also, that means you've learned it. Yeah, to too. an extent, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I was kind of curious how and you I, perceive that. You know, and I try to, it's fun to, it's fun to shoot it. And then like we filmed the episode and then next year it's like, oh, I'm going to go do it now. Yeah, you tend to, you know, I'll bring like me and Kendall will go try it. And it's, it's been really fun. Yeah. If you ever, um, again, like here's that apocalyptic niggle in me. Like if you ever had to do it, like you have so much knowledge yeah. that you've gained yeah. through this process. And that's what, that's what I hope we're doing with the TV show too, is kind of giving people that opportunity as well. Bring them along with us a little bit. Yeah. So that they can get a little taste of it and go try it themselves. That's been the whole taste of the wild, isn't that? <laughs> isn't that our block on? Yeah, uh, that's our block. Go, yeah. Our block on Monday nights on Outdoor Channel we're in. It's called Taste of the Wild. We share that with uh, Meat Eater. So Renella, uh, we share that with Mike Robinson, who yeah. does uh, hunting and farming the wild and Far- fishing. The farming wild. and fishing the wild. Yeah, yeah two great, separate great, shows. Great shows. And Andrew Zimmern. Yeah, yeah, and his Wild Game Kitchen, and then um, uh, Mario from Man Eats Wild. So anyway, that block we're in is called Taste of the Wild. And so, uh, yeah, like that's, that's, is the hope is that we're dropping into people's minds, the possibilities, the ideas, and like also that we'll go to places that we're like, sometimes we'll be doing an episode in a place and, and a person watching is like, oh, that could be done where I live. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we're going to do stuff that's like, oh, well, that's far away, far flung, can't really participate in that. But it gives you ideas of what you can do at home. Right. Um, it's certainly completely changed the way I look at the, like the wall of nature. Yeah. And I try to remember too, that, um, a lot of what we take for granted, cause you and I live fairly, what, what I think the average city person would consider rural. Right. Like I don't consider how we live very rural, Mm-mm. but it's more rural than suburbia. That's for sure. Yep. Um, I mean, looking out your windows right now, it's like trees in every direct, I could probably see like a thousand trees right now. Right. But, uh, but I think of when we go up to Northern Maine now, that feels rural to me. Yeah. You know? Like when we were up in Machias. Yeah. That's, that's much more rural, see. but still that said, um, a lot of people watching the show are going to be, you know, I've been thinking like, for instance, like, um, Andrew Huberman is always just pushing really hard. Like first thing in the morning, you need sunlight. to go outside and get sunlight. And I'm like, at my house, I'm kind of like, well, dude, I mean, 
all my windows. Hey, first he thing says in the not through windows. Yeah, I get it. But it's like, <laughs> I, you know, or when people are into grounding, you know, yeah. like they want to use a grounding technology, all those kind of things. A lot of things when you live rural, it's kind I of like. I had to walk to the compost pile today. Just, yeah, without, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I got to let my dogs out in the morning, dude. I'm barefoot outside, like getting firewood, you know, yeah. like these are not because it's like a practice and I'm trying to stack the practices that all add up to be like a big biohack thing. It's like just actually the lifestyle here. But so I'll take it for granted and I'll be like, man, why is he always going on about that? It's like, that's so easy and obvious. And then it's like, well, it wouldn't be if I lived in an apartment, you know, in the city, that would Mm -hmm. be harder. So, um, how'd I get there? What am I saying? All that, um, that we take for granted a lot of our associations to nature, but still we go outside. I see this, like all these trees. If If I'm not educated to them, it's like a big green, mass of life there's all this biomass maybe we'll call it and it's been a cool process over these years to have that biomass go from just a big conglomerate thing into a composition an ecosystem of all these different species and then to have use cases for each of those species and relationships to them I mean, this is a thing I've rehashed a lot on the show, but it's just having that connection to to all these different species, or maybe there's a species like I don't really use it, but I, it's associated to one that I do. And so it Mm -hmm. becomes like an indicator species of something else that alone has transformed my view of the world so completely at a time when I harbor deep concerns about, um, how people being born today will perceive the natural world as they move towards that digital environment. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one really helpful thing that you say a lot is like learn one new species a year. Mm -hmm. And if you keep doing that, I mean, you could do more than one really, but even if it's just one, all of a sudden you're like, wow, I know, I know I, I'm, I have a relationship now with the natural world Mm -hmm. so much more. That's a really good point. And then it's like, I say one because it takes a lot of pressure off people. Yeah. Cause it's really easy to learn a dozen too, but like that sounds like a lot to somebody, but it, it reminds me of that saying, um, we underestimate what we can do. I've heard it two ways. I, I've always said it. You underestimate what you, you overestimate what you'll do in a year. You massively underestimate what you'll accomplish in five. Yeah. But I've also heard people say like you overestimate what you can do in a day or a week. Yeah. And you underestimate what you'll do in a year. Cause that's one of the interesting things. You look back five years ago at your life if you go back five years, like you have no TV show, you don't have, oh right? God, don't like, remind yeah, me. like none of that. You know what I mean? Like you couldn't imagine that. Cause it's not, again, it's not that big picture. You know, you didn't have this all in a schematic of life plan where you're like, right. Here's that's how what I was just going to say. It's like the business plan thing you were talking about before. Like Jeff Bezos didn't plan to make Amazon. He He's just went step books. by step. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like the same thing. It's like, just get outside and do a little bit, do one thing. And then sooner or later, you're gonna be like, oh, I have like a deep connection with yes. with n- yes. nature now. Yes, and it, and it, you don't, un, you don't, you can't even possibly imagine doors that will open to you, people you will meet, because you have no way of predicting it. So, I think um, when I was talking before about deep immersion into learning, mm-hmm. I think one of the things that happens to me is that I'll, I'll get into something, and because I'm so focused on it, I start seeing it everywhere, and then I follow all those things up. What do you mean you follow it up? Um, so it's like people, you know, that thing of like, uh, I've always heard it in like self-help kind of spiritual books and stuff. They'll say like, if you, or all right, forget all that. Put it like this. You buy a new car, right? Let's say you bought a nice shiny new Honda Element. I was going to, I was going to hope you went there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you got a new <laughs> Honda Element. Now you're driving around and you start noticing Honda Elements. And you're like, man, there's a lot of Honda elements right. around. You start yes. seeing them everywhere, different colors. One, you really notice the ones that are the same color as yours. And oh, that one's got a brush guard. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then uh, after a while, you're like, man, they're everywhere. And it's not, and it feels like it's recent because you started to recently notice it, but obviously they were there before you were just filtering them out because they didn't have any special meaning yeah. to you. So what I'm saying is following up is let's say that every time you saw a Honda element, now you wave to the person. And then before you know it, you're pulling up next to somebody with it and you're talking Honda elements and you keep following it. And before you know it, this is how somebody like my brother goes from developing an interest in, in motorcycles 
to, to now he races them, yeah. you know, when he's part of like a league and he yep. races at a track all the time because he just kept following that. So if you do this before you know it, you're bumping into other foragers. Now you're talking about them. You're reading about this book. Now you go into this workshop and yeah. before you know it, you're networked into a thing. I think it's important to force yourself to do that type of thing too. Like, yeah. like uh, it, 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 yes, it's overwhelming to, to get out there and do this type of thing. But it also, and it's like, yeah, take take it slow, do it one species at a time, but also like be disciplined, yeah. like make yourself do it because it's easy to just not do it. It's easy to re just read about it. Or it's easy to just listen to this podcast or watch a TV show, you know, and, and to touch upon what you were saying with like following up. That's why I put those species of all the animals that I like regularly hunt on my car it's because like every once in a while somebody, Wait, let's like, be clear stickers of yes, pictures of those animals thank on you. your car just so people <laughs> stickers, know what you're talking yeah, about thank you so it's like every once in a while like my plow guy he pulled up he's like i was the whole time i was talking he just like wouldn't stop looking at the stickers he's like you hunt and all of a sudden he's like you know we're, yeah. we're like talking shop and and yeah before you know it like you you're getting a new hunting spot you're getting a new buddy yeah you're being exactly. told about something you didn't know about you find out that there's something that yeah, it all yeah like the end of that doors. conversation he's like i find out he's a really good turkey hunter and yeah. he's like come out with me sometime that's cool yeah yeah so that's the that's what i'm talking about and I think everybody understands that. Like for sure, everybody who's just heard that understands that. Mm -hmm. The breakdown is in the application of actually following the threads. You know, like you just said, like you need to have discipline to do that. Mm. I think that's where things break down. I think everybody gets how that part works. It's just that not everybody wants to always put in yeah, the work. Something it's about some, it is hard. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe harder for other some people than well, others. Well, there's a but. lot to do, right? Like some people are like, yeah, well, you know, when you have three kids and you run a business and you, it's like, how, when are you going to do all that? So... Mm -hmm. Um, I get that piece too, but then, man, obsession is how things get, things happen through obsession a lot mm -hmm. of times, right? So anyway, um, I just think following it up, um, and you know, and not, obviously not everybody needs these skills, you know, that's the other thing. It's like, there's so many skills to develop. To me, when I think about hunting and gathering, it's like this extremely fundamental human thing. So I give it more weight than I would give to certain other things, like other hobbies that you could get drawn into because it's like if you're going to develop life skills to me it ha it's so ancestral that mm -hmm. i think it it nourishes something really really deep and i don't just mean that like the double entendre of it like being like what well, nourishes because if the food piece but it like really psychologically and to develop re at a time where the world is going through a tremendous shift about how we relate to the natural world in two directions like a bifurcated thing where it's like Partially, it's the, oh my gosh, we need to save habitat, ecology, climate, like all these things. Like there's a tremendous shift in how we, and in particular, a realization that the European way of relating to the natural world has led to a loss of tremendous biodiversity, even whole species in general and all this kind of stuff. So there's that shift underway and then a recognition of the more indigenous way of looking at other species as kin and that like we're still a long way from that but that's underway right now like where we're like wait we need to reestablish, you know people like david attenborough who've dedicated their lives to helping us not anthropomorphize animals because not that that's a dangerous game i think but to see relational connections where it's like oh they are like us in a lot of ways you know and we are not just uniquely God's created hue, you know, like we were here to dominate and control and use everything as resources. Like, wow, we need to also kind of have a kind of a kinship relationship with wild things. So at the same time, we're having the like artificial reality, virtual reality built environment kind of thing happening. We also have this return to nature thing happening. Mm -hmm. So at a time where all that's going down, it's so valuable to make these kinds of connections. But at the same time, there's a lot of other useful things to learn too. Hmm, like yeah, it's like sure. so useful to like figure out how to do permaculture on your land or cut your own firewood or, you know, start a business or raise your kids. Like all that stuff's important. So I get that not everybody's needs these life skills, but some of us are really drawn to them. And um, I'm, I guess to wrap bow on what we're saying, I hope that the podcast in posterity becomes a place people in the future can go to, um, satisfy a whole bunch of knowledge gaps i feel like these skills that you're talking about are like something that's like intrinsic in our being you mm -hmm. know that and that's why so many people are drawn to it yep. 
And uh, agree. and that's just, I think it's important for people to at least try to do this type of thing because it's like been in our DNA for since we've been humans. Yeah, that's why I think somebody like Monsal Denton is always like booked out with his secret hunting mm. thing because not everybody who goes to one of those is going to necessarily live as like the hunting lifestyle. But knowing how to do that quiets the part of the brain that's always like shouting into your subconscious like you don't know how to live on this planet (laughs) and like you said it is so intrinsic like i remember the first (laughs) animal (laughs) the first animal i skinned and gutted was a um rabbit that my friend had shot and uh neither of us knew what we were doing he just like he was like i shot it can you figure out what to do with it and I just figured out, right. you know, like intuitively what to do with it. And I cooked it not over fire. And like, I didn't know what I was doing, but it, it's not that hard to figure out either, you know. How many times have you taken somebody out hunting or foraging and they say something like, oh, this is so, f- this feels familiar. Yeah, I know. It's like a constant thing. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that's fr- endlessly frustrating about science is how it only recognizes what's, well, it's also why science is so great. But it's also its downfall, too. So it's one of those double-edged sword things where what's great about science is that it doesn't accept things that it can't prove yet because that's how you get into the realm of accepting superstitions as uh, established truth. Like, you know, the earth is flat and the universe revolves around it. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's how we avoid that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, like, we don't yet have a mechanism for which to describe genetic memory Right. In any kind of functional way. So so when I go, hey, I, I've i never gutted this an animal before, but when I did it, it just felt familiar. Well, it's like, that's not, like when I zoom out, it's like, well, yeah, dude. I mean, you come from, you know, three million years of every single person in your lineage up until like three centuries ago, not even, like three generations ago has done this. Yeah. So there must be some remnant, like... But it's easy for somebody to be like, oh, come on. Yeah. There's no, show me a study that proves that. Yeah. It's like, well, I can't yet because we haven't developed the um, the instruments with which to measure that. But we may in the future. And it would be, you know, it's like this thing. Um, I was just reading an article. Uh, one of our listeners sent in um, an article about uh, the antiquity of human beings in North America because we recently had on Dan Flores. And um, even in that interview, the dates have been pushed back. Because it was for a mm. long time, there was this Clovis first thing, and it's like, look, there were, the first people got here fourteen thousand years ago, eleven to fourteen thousand years ago in North America. There's no, you know, in in Native American people were like, hey, uh, we'd like to differ on that. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have, we, we think we go back way further, and it's like, well, you can't prove it. Here's the rocks or whatever. <laughs> so. <laughs> Like as if the entire surface of North America has been excavated and we found all the sites. Yeah. So including, what happens including is... Including what's under the ocean. Right. Including you know, all of that prior landmass that's now seafloor, uh, where most of the artifacts no doubt are because people like to live by the coast. Um, and newsflash, the ice caps melted. So <laughs> <laughs> the ice age is over. Uh, so... What happens is the age of humans being in North America is always based on the oldest site that we've currently found, and then we find an older one, and it keeps getting pushed back. This paper I read today was um, suggesting dates like 130,000 years ago, which currently sound like... What are we at right now, 14? Well, no, there was the White Sands footprints. Which is? I want to say like 20 plus, like 21,000 years Mm -hmm. or something like that, but which is also significant. Yeah. But we'll find something else. Mm-hmm. Like, we'll keep doing this game, right? We'll keep playing this game because science will only accept what it can understand currently based on things that it can prove. Mm-hmm. Again, that's its strength and its greatest weakness. Mm. Um, but the point is, we don't know how to... We b- both can't measure how we would have kind of a genetic memory. And we also don't really know what the impacts of not living with traditional activities behaviors in our lifestyle like what are the real impacts of that you know i mean we look at people now and it's like one thing that's for sure going on is mental health is that it's like oh, yeah. it's kind of in a, in a bad place um and it seems to correlate with tremendous changes in our life way mm-hmm. but you know same's true of our health you know same's true of um 
chronic disease, of course, and all these things, but we just don't, we haven't necessarily figured out how to properly quantify it. Yeah. Or like, I guess we can quantify it, but we can't necessarily like attribute it. Right. Okay. You know what yeah. I mean? But I think at some level doing some of these activities, like you said, even if you go out one time and you go out and you learn how to like shoot a squirrel and gut it and all of that and like then cook it and eat it. We don't know yet how to say like what benefit that has. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's kind of like, like, let's say that you live with a childhood trauma. Like, le like many of the people listening to the show will have been sexually assaulted at some point in their life or, you know, particularly as children. And let's say that that's you and you live, you're, you're living with that secret and that trauma going out one time and talking to somebody about it resolves so much for a person. Doesn't That's not the end of the healing process, but it's like a huge step. So much is relieved in a person's psyche when they finally air that. It takes It's like taking a heavy backpack off for somebody, right? So like similarly, I mean, this is like a weird analogy. No, that's so actually a really good. I anybody. I don't, I don't mean it to offend anybody. That's a anybody. great analogy. I mean actually. it in solidarity with people. But it's like, if you have this niggling part of your mind, that's like, man, you don't even know how, like if, if supermarket shut off on you, you wouldn't know even what to do. And then you go out and you learn that, like that part of your brain like is relieved. And now you can move on to the other things that are important to you. And so, uh, you know, I, that's one of the ways in which I think learning just like one food can be just can quiet a uh, part of the subconscious that it's different than trauma, but it's like, it's more like a fear. It's like, oh my gosh, like I live uh, tenuously through the um, consistency of the supply chain, which I now know is um, fragile. Yeah. Fragile. And that uh, in a breakdown, I'm not a priority. Mm -hmm. I think that was a big learning lesson. You know, Vani and I have been talking about this week, COVID happened and we have all kind of moved on and life's gotten kind of back to a, its new normal or whatever. And I'm like, man, see, you know, we just sat down the other day, started talking about how incredible that is what we just lived through. Mm. I mean, these last several years, like, oh my goodness, this like massive shakeup to the, how the world works. <laughs> we just, you know, we're kind of like, move on in the way like you get in a car accident and it's really bad. Maybe somebody's hurt really bad, but then it's like, okay, the next day you still got to pay your bills and get move on with your life. And you do. And then you look back and you're like, Oh my God, this really traumatic thing happened. It's like, wow, the whole planet got shut down. That was really intense. Mm -hmm. And we've all kind of moved on, but it's like, wow, this is like a, this thing revealed a lot about ourselves, a lot about our government, a lot about, the priorities of people whose job it's been to shepherd us and maybe like what their actual agendas are. And, uh, it's revealed a lot about what's true and what's not. And, that, and then also what's really interesting is it's revealed that how easily people fall into two camps of what's true and yeah. how vehemently they'll defend things. And uh, it was particularly interesting being like silenced on a lot of things and then those things eventually becoming accepted truth. Because like in my lifetime, I'd never had like the Galileo experience where you're like, right. no, look, like look through the telescope. You can see like there's moons around Jupiter mm -hmm. and they're like, we will not look through it and we'll burn you at the stake. Shut up. You can't speak. Like, you know, I'd heard that kind of a story, but I'd never had it where you say something and people freak out on you. And then within a couple of years, it's a completely accepted truth. It's like, wow, that's a pretty interesting thing. So anyway, we've just lived through this trauma. And my point of bringing all that up is that that trauma revealed for some people that they don't know what to do without the existing system in place. And for that reason, I just think it's important that, that somebody remembers how to hunt and gather. Yeah. <laughs> like you've said, even if it's, <clears throat> even if it's just something that lives on in a museum, mm -hmm. it's something that needs to live on. Yeah. If we do it like reenactment style, <laughs> like, that's like something. Gettysburg. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings me to my next point, which is that just like Gettysburg, as I've been considering sort of concluding the show and like really looking big picture at everything that we've learned through this process and the journey of it, I'm, I'm actually most amazed that the degree to which it's possible for a modern person in America 
to hunt and gather still. Yeah. I actually can, I can scarcely believe it. I mean, we're having discussions about like banning gas stoves. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're going like, uh, not that this is about whether that's the right choice or the wrong choice, but just that so much is changing yet you could still go out and do these things. Like you, everything is so regulated. It's like, good luck if you want to build something in your backyard. It's like, you got to go get permitted and you got to licensed and you got to have site, you know, inspections and, you know, EPA and like, oh, there's so many rules about every little aspect of our lives. And then you can also still hunt and gather. It's like, I can still go into the woods with a gun and shoot animals. It's like amazing. Do you think that regulations will come to foraging before hunting? I do. Yeah. I do. And I want to get into a little bit of why actually. Um, So yeah. So big picture, I'm amazed that we can do this still. I can't really like for example, for in New England, you can't really do it legally. Unless it's on your own property. Yeah. Or you have permission from the landowner. So, but at the same time, as you know, it's largely overlooked. Right. Um, Most, you know, it's just like very infrequently have we had anybody. Never. I don't think I've never, I've never really experienced. You know, I mean, every once in a while you get to a place, maybe you're not supposed to be. But yeah, yeah, the point is uh, the fact that in, uh, that it's so different too. That's the other thing. Like hunting in New England is so different than hunting in the South, which is so different than hunting in the West. And then where you have, you know, it's like, like it, it's no mystery to anybody. Hunting tends to break down kind of, you know, if you're looking at a U.S. map, like red versus blue states, like it's not, it's pretty obvious where most of the hunting's happening to. So that's like another component of it that's overlaid over this. But the fact that it's still possible is incredible. I do think that I'm concerned about the future of all of it. I think that we'll start to see laws about foraging first because it's not there's not a bulwark in place of political resistance the way you have with hunting Mm -hmm. it's so entrenched the north american model of conservation that kind of was pioneered by like the teddy roosevelt folks in that era um the all the nonprofits and organizations that are in place to protect and fight for hunting rights plus the unique fact that the second amendment, I mean, it's just so brilliant when you look back at historically, like the fact that they got this constitutional amendment in there for those who are against firearm ownership, it must be such a thorn in their side that there's a constitutional amendment. It's sort of like, imagine what would happen in the United States right now if we didn't have the first amendment, like they don't have that in any other country that I'm aware of. So like Canada, for instance, which I love that country. My wife's from there, you know, I love it there. I've, I've lived up there. I spent a lot of time there, but they do not have an enshrined constitutional right to free speech, which has allowed a whole bunch of things to happen there in recent years that couldn't, can't happen here yet because of that. And the amount of censorship we've seen pushed in the United States in the last few years has been remarkable, but tempered by the fact that we have a First Amendment. So similarly, hunting... It's like it's constantly fighting back against that censorship. Right. Just by just by existing. Right. And they have still continued to censor, but they've done it in roundabout ways. So it's been like, well, these are private entities, so they can censor you because they're not... It's not government. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's like you, you get your posts down-regulated on a social media or even the you know, so-called shadow banning or, um, whatever it is, just the down regulating of posts that don't agree with certain things that is possible because it's not the government doing it, but compulsory speech, for instance, is really hard to pull off here, but you can do it in Canada. In other words, you must say these things. That's a whole nother realm. That's, that's why Jordan Peterson went from being a sort of obscure professor to a national figure is because he was fighting initially was fighting compulsory speech not because he was fighting censorship, but compulsory speech. So um, that, that anyway, all that stuff is stymied by the first amendment. Similarly with the second amendment in place, there's a deeply woven interrelated thing going on with hunting because the people can have guns, which makes like, if we didn't have a, a second amendment, 
hunting would probably be largely eviscerated by now. And for people who are like, no, there'd just be more bow hunting. It's like, keep in mind that a lot of Europe, bow hunting is illegal and considered unethical. Like you can't hunt with a bow in most of Europe. It's like not legal. So don't assume <laughs> that like if guns went away, you could just hunt still. It's like, that's not a guaranteed thing. So uh, it was interesting. We did a show not long ago about, um, uh, you know, states creating a constitutional right for people to hunt. Mm -hmm. But of course, we've also been watching a big fight play out between states' rights and government and federal rights. And so, um, yeah, it's just, just because a state allows you to do something doesn't mean that the federal government can't regulate it too. So um, I'm very concerned about long-term what's going to happen with firearm ownership in the United States. I don't think it'll be easy to ban firearms, but there's certainly a massive contingent of the country that would like to. So they'll have to chip, out away, uh, chip away at it in other ways, which I think will be largely through regulating ammunition um, through the Environmental Protection Agency, which is probably a good idea because of lead. I think lead is a super toxic substance. I think those who interact with lead become incapable of seeing the negative effects because the negative effects of lead on people are to your IQ. So, I mean, that's it's kind of a funny little twist of fate. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> I think through, you know, lead contamination will be one of the ways. And then even by creating market conditions that stress the manufacturing because we've seen that in recent years where there was massive ammunition shortages that weren't caused by regulation. They were caused by the industry itself responding to the market. And so if you can figure out how to do that, then you can figure out how to create those conditions, which will lead to the drying up of ammunition. So um, another way is that um, when, when people are hearing about these loopholes, the firearm loopholes, the gun show loophole, if they're not firearms people, they won't know what this loophole means. And so the, I think the average American has been left because of the propaganda it's like um, the way we word things. You know, the abortion arguments like this because you get like one side calls itself pro-choice and everybody's like, well, I want to have choice. And the other side's like, well, we're pro-life. And everybody's like, well, I want life. Mm -hmm. Like both sides are, are there. They have terminology that don't necessarily represent what they actually are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, like you hear this term firearm loophole and peop it just leaves people thinking that you can just go on the internet and buy guns and they just send them to your house or something. It's like, no, they're talking about transfers between people that, that I can sell you a gun. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I can leave a gun to my son or daughter. And that's something that is being chipped away at as we speak. And the idea is that you would have to go through a dealer to do that. And that'd be like one more way... That like, yeah, okay, this generation gets to keep doing it, but then when they go to try to pass on to the next generation, becomes, there's stuff in the way of that. That might not sound like that big a deal to people, but it, with the tenuous nature of the relationship of hunting in the United States, it's all of these things at once start to make it too difficult for most people to get into it. So I'm concerned long-term, but that said, we have a constitutional amendment and we have all of these organizations in place to protect these rights to hunt and the way that we manage animals in the United States. You know, there's obviously always going to be a condition of people who are like, we shouldn't manage nature at all. And it's like, yeah, but dude, <laughs> sorry. Have you looked around lately? There's like condos everywhere. Like nature's getting managed. And so for that reason, wildlife will always have to be managed and hunting is the main tool that's used for that now. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to plants, None of this stuff's in place. There's no amendments. There's not these big organizations. There's not like Dandelions Unlimited to make sure that you always have <laughs> access to it, you know? So I'm concerned that we'll first see sweeping laws in the foraging side and they'll come from good place. They'll come from a desire to protect nature, but it'll come from people who don't interact with nature enough to understand what that means. If you want to upset a group of middle-aged women, bring uh, milkweed to dinner. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> all of a sudden, like the intense monarch butterfly nonsense you hear. Yeah. It's like, yeah, no, we agree. We're actually helping to spread this plant. We believe in this plant. We want this plant here. But it's like how when you try to tell, a, a, not a non-hunter, but like an anti-hunter, somebody who's really like against hunting, and you try to explain to them how much you love deer and how you want there to be more deer, and they're like, you just want more deer so you can shoot more deer. And you're like, oh, yeah, kind of, but <laughs> not fully. It's like... It's like trying to explain to somebody like, no, I want there to be more milkweed. It's just because you want to eat the milkweed. It's like, mm, okay, <laughs> I, I don't know if that matters, but uh, yeah. 
So, so yeah, I am concerned about, um, you know, just in the time we've made this show, there was that moment where Maine was like looking at legislation that would have banned foraging. Banned? Yeah. Uh, even fined you pretty heavily for it. Remember where it was like going to basically, it would be that if you were caught foraging plants on land that wasn't yours, there was a fine. And then if you had a firearm, firearm it was like a massively higher fine, which made meant that if you were hunting and you came across a mushroom, like you could get, you know, luckily that didn't happen, but I'm worried about that kind of thing happening. What do you, so, what do you think about regulation of foraging, like similar to how hunting is regulated? So that's something we've batted around on this show quite a bit. Um, and I, I think that it, it's funny. Part of me doesn't like it at all because I'm like, I don't want more regulation at the same time part of me loves the idea because it would enshrine that regulation and allow it to take place in perpetuity. So because when I talk to older hunters, they're always complaining about all the rules, the new rules, but I came into hunting with those rules in place. So I don't feel backlash against those rules. So a great example would be, you know, Lawrence who he won't duck hunt anymore because of the change to stainless steel you know, and, and he wants to use lead. Well, he used to hunt ducks with lead in his mind. Steel doesn't kill ducks as well. And he thinks the whole thing was about, you know, money. And uh, he's got all these ideas about this that I just didn't, I didn't live through that. That happened a long time ago. I mean, that was like when I was like three years old or something. Right. So I don't remember any of this stuff, but for him, um, he still is holding on to like anger about the regulation to me, I'm stoked we can still hunt ducks, mm -hmm. you know? So similarly, like, I think if there started to be foraging regulation right now, there'd be all kinds of pushback from foragers who felt like, hey, this is a natural thing I'm doing. It shouldn't be regulated by the government. At the same time, in 100 years, if there was people who could forage because there was rules in place, they'd just be stoked they could forage um, and that it hadn't been shut off completely. So the thing is, is that when you're looking at a state regulating hunting, they're looking at a few dozen animals at best, usually, usually a lot less than that. But at most, you know, they're going to have a couple dozen species that they manage. It's very easy to train the wardens to do that. It's very easy to <laughs> identify what a white-tailed deer is. It starts getting real, you know, if you wanted to regulate foraging, that would mean new departments and bureaucracies that would have to have tremendous amount of botanical and mycological training yeah and the number of species would be outrageous right like hundreds if not you know over a thousand species per state that they would need to know be able to identify this isn't a lion's mane it's a bear's head tooth mushroom yeah, exactly <laughs> they're <laughs> all heresium i like, swear yeah that could get really complicated so i don't know how uh it's a bigger picture than anything i'm really wanting to take on but i do ultimately i prefer regulation and foraging in perpetuity over bucking regulation. Then one day sweeping regulation makes the whole thing criminal, mm -hmm. uh, which might sound to some people listening like, Oh yeah, right. Like that's going to happen. It's like, yeah, well, that kind of thing happens all the time. So, you know, businesses get regulated out of existence all the time. Like this stuff. I mean, just in my business, the supplement industry, I have seen tremendous sweeping regulatory changes just in the 15 years I've been a part of it. So, mm. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. So that does concern me. Um, like you said, it's out of, it's out of, uh, like a good hearted reason. The reason yeah, is like to yeah. help. Yes, correct. I mean, it would, it would come from a typically, it wouldn't be because the conspiracy people would be like, they just don't want you to have access to the healthiest food in the world. Right. Right. Like Alex Jones will be doing that, you know, shouting that like, this is, this is designed to cut you off from your relationship to nature. And it's like, I don't, I mean, maybe George Soros wants that, but like, I don't think that that's what's, what would be happening at the regulatory level. It would just be like, Oh my God, we got to protect these plants because of what happened to American ginseng or what happened to golden seal because people are a plant becomes popular. Chaga is this great example. I mean, Chaga has become massively popular uh, obviously not a plant, a fungus, but, uh, but now everybody knows it's worth some money. A lot of times people harvest it and use it so irrationally. Like they take a football sized chaga and drop it in a lobster pot, boil it once and throw it away. And you're like, man, that's like three years worth mm -hmm. of medicine right there. So, um, at some point that'll get regulated 
And yeah. what they'll probably do is just ban you cutting it. They're not going to want to create... I don't know. I hope not. It's a lot more work to bring in mycologists and to talk to all the experts and then develop a harvesting protocol with licensing. And then you got to get that state. licensing has to be, yeah, state by state. And then the licensing has to be enough to pay for the costs of the regulation because mm -hmm. now you've got to create new jobs. Those jobs need offices. Those offices have overhead lights and, you know, electricity and all this. Kind of, like all of that stuff's going to cost money, which means that you've got to then license people to pay for it. It's got to cover all of that. So it's a lot easier for them to go like, let's just ban this. <laughs> <laughs> like how, how many people are we really talking about here? Yeah. You know what I mean? So... Yeah, so I'm concerned about the future of hunting, fishing, and foraging. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really, really important. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about how important it will feel. Like, so just to, to date this podcast, we're having this conversation around the time that chat GTP hit the scene. Mm -hmm. I think this will be remembered as a fairly important point oh, yeah. in the relationship of human beings with digital technology yeah for sure recently one of the weinsteins was on rogan what, what's which eric eric is the kind of far more far out physicist mm -hmm. one he brought up this great point he was like rogan was like man the, you know how crazy all the things that have changed in the world it's getting so crazy and it's getting so futuristic and eric is like not really he's like think about if aside from screens and personal computing What's changed? What's changed? How would this not be the 70s? Like, uh, you look around, he's like, you know, besides like fashion, like bell bottoms versus tight jeans or whatever, largely our lifestyle hasn't changed that much except for the introduction of um, the computing power that we have. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, we definitely don't have like flying cars or, you know, we can't teleport anywhere or any of that kind of stuff. We just have screens now. So in that way, the world has not changed that much. So I want to give, I want, I want to honor that kind of perspective yet. They've changed a lot and, um, artificial intelligence has been released into the wild essentially, <laughs> you know, even if it's, um, there's debate about what this thing actually is, it's clearly where we're going. So as we go towards that and people start to immerse more, I know at this point too, like I've had listeners push back against some of the stuff we've talked about here, particularly, when I get a little doomy about some of this stuff and I'll have people write me like things like, look, like the metaverse isn't even a thing. Like it's not doing well. Like Zuckerberg lost a lot of money on that. It's like, I'm sorry. That's, it might not be doing great now, but it's obviously where things are moving. So as that happens, people's relationship to the natural world, not, this is another place we get confused. People forget how quickly populations age out. So yeah, for us at our age group, we still remember like the natural world and all this. But if you're Gen Z, like it's only, we're not far from that's who's running the world. I mean, that's not going to be that long when, till Gen Z is who's running the businesses, who's running for political office, who's making regulation. Like it won't be long before millennials have to pass on that torch. And so that's going to be a group of people who does has a much more tenuous relationship to the natural world than us. Mm. So that's another concern I have is, is, uh, it's, this is not a, a diss to that generation. Obviously that generation is perfectly adapted to the world they've been born into. Like they are, they are the adaptation to the changes that have happened. The problem is the changes that have happened are so digital and built and not natural that they are adapted it's like the joke that I always have made for years. Like what happens when you take a chihuahua and you put it into the forest? It's not adapted. It's a wolf, but it's not adapted to the wolfy world anymore. It's adapted to an extremely cushy built environment. So uh, I have concerns that as the boomers are aging out now, well, even the si like Lawrence is from the silent, silent generation. So that's before the boomers. He's still hunting. Hmm. but he'll age out in the next few years. And then the boomers will start to age out of hunting. My generation X will inherit it, but you know, we're a lot smaller hunting population. We start aging out of that millennials like yourself start taking it over and then it's Gen Z. So it's like when we talk about population control, you know, this is one of those things too. Cause like the, 
the Alex Joneses of the world love to be like, they're going to try to kill us all off and they're going to murder all, they're coming for you, they're going to kill us all, they're population control. It's like, you don't need to do that. You just convince people like me not to have kids and I didn't. And then I removed two people from the population and you, in a generation, you can massively change demographics. Hmm. And so similarly, you know, by, it's like, a lot of people in this generation that's coming up now not only aren't going to have kids but won't be able to have kids for multiple reasons. So that's going to cause a massive population. That's why people like Elon Musk are talking. Like it must sound crazy to people who aren't hip to this stuff. Like why is Elon Musk talking about a population implosion? Like that sounds crazy. There's so many people. Yeah, why does Elon Musk have 10 plus kids? Because yeah, <laughs> he's concerned that there's yeah. going to be a population implosion yeah. because most people aren't having kids. Now that's not true throughout the entire planet, but that's true in the first world environment for sure. So similarly, um, my concern about hunting long-term isn't just that PETA is going to convince people that hunting is bad. It's that a relationship to the natural world could be lost in a generation who's raised with all of their priorities in the digital space. Because when, when I was a kid, I haven't got to hear too much about this for you, so I'd be curious. But when I was a kid playing outside in, in nature, there wasn't like a lot of other options than that. Right. I mean, that's, that's something we did because your parents for gen X, it was a, the way we grew up is so different than today. We were like kicked out of the house in the morning Yeah. and we didn't like, it would be like make it home by dark and you'd just be out doing crazy shit. Dude, when I was a, like, I was like 10 years old, we used to jump trains <laughs> and ride them for miles and then jump off the train we used to walk train tracks, but we didn't. Yeah. remember ha yeah, hanging out on train tracks as a yeah. kid, like stuff that today, like, you know, I'm sure kids still do that, but those kids who are doing that are coming from places and homes that probably aren't very supervised. Right. But the average parent now has concerns for their kids that were really different back in the day. So, um, we would be in nature all the time, like fig, you know, starting fires, do all kinds of crazy things mm -hmm. that today you you kind of like, it's not as easy to do those kind of things. So we experienced nature by default. Mm -hmm. But today you'd have to have parents who are dedicated to immersing their kid in nature. And there are a lot of those parents, but to be the, that, that means that you probably are socioeconomically very stable. Right. And that's not everybody. So that creates a class kind of distinction where, you know, most, this is obviously not going to be universally true, but it's going to be a bit of a classist thing. If you have a nature immersion experience as a child, it's probably because your parents were really well off mm -hmm. enough that they had the leisure time to embrace that lifestyle and the education to know what they were embracing and the finances to allow for all of that. So yeah, it's like my nephews, they're pretty well first well versed in nature you know and it's because they went to like a waldorf school and right, right. they like it yeah they're, they're homeschooled at some, some point in their life and they're that's part of like the curriculum it's like to go out into right. nature so you know if you think about the um there's all there's that other side of that that flip side of that let's say like you were gonna caricaturize the like poor appalachian family Mm -hmm. they're also going to know nature because of their socioeconomic, because they can't afford all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. But the world's being gentrified. So a lot of that. So I think what my point is like in the future, in the past when we thought about like, well, who's, who knows how to hunt and fish? It's like, well, those poor people who still live up in the mountains inbreeding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. in the future, it'll be like, who knows this stuff? It'll be like, well, the people who can afford it. Yeah. And so there's a, my, I guess my point is massive demographic changes are underway and that combined with the um, push to remove firearm sovereignty from people, plus the pressure from groups like the American Humane Society who are trying to like curb hunting, get rid of it, like all of that stuff. And the people who've been fighting against it aging out and the generation backfilling, not even knowing about any of this stuff, puts it all in a very tenuous place. So... I want to add another layer to that too. One of the things that's happened over the years that we've been making the show, not happened, but I've become more aware of and had to be more realistic about is the concerns that I have about pollution in wildlife. Mm. Because we all love the argument of like, this is the beyond organic diet, but it's not actually. So 
there's been the conversation about these fluorocarbons, like the forever chemicals, keep yeah. hearing that forever chemicals, you know, you get a dose of supposedly, I mean, at least from research I've been sent, you, you get like a year's dose of forever chemicals from one freshwater fish. Yeah. I've read that recently. And you picture like, for instance, the fish in Sebago where, where we've done a lot of ice fishing, you partic- particular more than me. Um, Hey, Hey. Well, you know, I fished a different body of water is all I mean. But that was, you were living on that hey, lake. Hey, you have a, just as many forever chemicals yeah, as mine, I do. Mine just come out of moose pond. <laughs> Instead, you were fishing lake trout. I was fishing salmon. But <laughs> both of us were getting doses of these. Though you ate a lot more of those than I did. <laughs> so uh, the point is, um, you you know that lake. Like, how many boats? What lake? What you say? Yeah, what you all say? Here, pass me the lead sandwich. <laughs> You look at how many boats are on that yeah. lake, how much fuel is getting spilled in that, how many soft plastic baits are at the bottom of it, how many years of all of those houses discharging stuff into the water. Even with the most clean and well-regulated home, you know that all kinds of, every time it rains, stuff's just Shingle running rooms. down. Yeah, all that's going into that lake. And then it's like, I wonder how these fatty fish at the bottom are eating. So, you know, that's one of the things over the years when I first started really getting serious about all of this, ice fishing was like really important to me. I, I just, it was like a great, w- now I've got all this gear for it. I love the activity of it, but I'm, I'm not somebody who likes to fish catch and release. Cause I, I just ethically, I just think that's a weird thing to do. You know, it's like, these are living creatures like poking holes in them for fun is not how I, I, there's a lot more I can do for fun than that. So I don't like that. So personally, that means that I got to fish in the ocean because pollution is diluted. It's not like the ocean's clean. It's just more dilute. Mm -hmm. And I'm not comfortable eating, you know, you know, every once in a while I'll eat a fish out of fresh water, but that's not really what I want to do. So Another concern I have is like the the very first deer that I shot and started bringing home were from North Carolina. I quickly started realizing where I was hunting was covered in GMO ag fields. And just so in case anybody's like, oh, that's pseudoscience. There's nothing bad about GMOs. It looked at the amount of pesticide they can put on GMOs. That's what they're genetically modified for is pesticide application. So where do you shoot these deer? You shoot them at the edges of these fields. Yeah. And there's a huge population of deer there because there's so much ag and the deer eat. And, and I later found out like that this town that I was hunting in had one of the higher cancer rates of anywhere in the country. And so it's not because of the deer, it's because of the ag, but is it good to eat deer that have been eating those crops? And then another one would be waterfowl, which is like, I love where we live because our ducks are flying down. They've been feeding up in the Arctic and they fly down through and past us. But for a lot of the country, ducks are eating pretty heavy on these ag fields. And again, that's where you're hunting a lot of the times is near the ag. And so the fish are polluted, (laughs) the wildlife's polluted. And this is a big concern I have too, because if I eat a chicken from the farm, uh, up the road from us, that's a super young animal that's whose diet's been controlled mm-hmm. and the land that they're on has, has been worked organically for many, many years. And so for, I haven't done biopsies and had them tested, but for sure that animal's going to have a lower, I would, I would suspect now it's not going to be free of it because it's in the rain. It's, it's in the soil stuff's everywhere there's pollution everywhere. And so it's not like I'm saying that the food from an organic farm is pure. And I am not, I'm more of a realist than that. Uh, And the animals that we raise domestically have more body fat. It's like you render out a, you cook a chicken, the amount of fat on a chicken compared to what's on a wild Turkey or a grouse. Oh, I'm getting hungry. So, yeah, sorry. But the, uh, (laughs) that body fat is the repository for a lot of these environmental pollutants. And so, um, at least a lot of the wild game is leaner, but that's not going to be always be true. It's not true of a bear you yeah. know, or whatever. Um, and it's definitely not true of a lot of fish like the lake trout or the salmon. They're pretty oily. So that means they're going to, they're going to hold on to a lot of that stuff. I, anyway, I, the point is, I think that at some point people in hunting and fishing are going to have to get realistic 
about the amount of pollution that can potentially contaminate a lot of those animals. And what's happened for me over the years of doing this is that a lot of things that I was hip to eat in the beginning, I've lost my taste for. Like freshwater fish? Yeah. Yeah. Freshwater, like the landlocked salmon here, like the suckers in the spring. You know, I love that. I love going out and spearing suckers in the spring. What a great, it's like such a fun way to experience these coming weeks that are about to happen as the season changes and you're finally getting outside to do stuff again. Yet, I don't think that's good to eat. So do I want to be out there killing suckers for no reason? It's like, not really. I'd rather there be more suckers in the lake than you hear this. You hear this dog in the background groaning and moaning. Well, that's a good reason to do it. (laughs) Feed him. Yeah. Yeah. It is, uh, it is, and uh, I agree. Because, because, uh, like we were talking, it, it ties back into what we were talking about, like getting out there to experience this practice of hunting and gathering. If you can find a reason to do it, is what I'm saying. Yes, I agree. Then, like, it's worth doing. I agree. So, if it's just supplementing your dog's food too, because they only live 14 years. Come on, buddy, you can make it to yeah. 15, <laughs> Lincoln. You can well, at least 12 now. So, but yeah, so if you can, you know, that it's not going to affect them I like agree. it's going to affect or us. Or like my neighbor who who gardens with him takes the suckers and plants them with his tomatoes or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with all that. I agree with you, but I'll, what I'm trying to say is that my, from a dietary perspective, which yeah. is the main driver for me, yeah. I'm becoming more selective. Like I'm so excited for our trip to Greenland. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Grant and I have a trip to Greenland booked for season four of wild vet. And we're going to go there to hunt musk ox and caribou. Mm-hmm. I am so excited to eat that meat. Yeah, Mark. from from such a clean environment. I have a um, a cow in my freezer right now that was raised on organic pasture. It's a whole life killed, and it was probably like less than a year. I don't know. But I probably killed him like eighteen months actually. Yeah, I'd say inside two years. And then I also have venison in my freezer. What do you think has the lower chemical load? Yes. So that's the thing. It's not gonna. It's not gonna be. All right. Like you've been doing some macro counting, right? Yes. Okay. You for sure have figured out that when you're, we're talking about uh, macros like fat, carbohydrate, and protein, Mm -hmm. and like figuring out how much of that you're eating in your diet. So if you bought everything you ate at like the Walmart super center, Mm -hmm. and everything is like pretty uniform, you could probably trust that your macros were pretty accurate. Mm Mm-hmm. But realistically, like if you go to the farmer's market, you get a tomato there and you go get a tomato at Hannaford or whatever, some supermarket, they're not going to be the same, you know, there are going to be a lot of differences. And so macros end up becoming this kind of generic, oh, I don't know, this is, it says this is 500 calories, but you know, realistically, it might be 300 and it might be 700. It's like not, unless you could actually like ash everything and spectrograph it at your house, you're not really going to know accurately right so similarly you could look up like well how much pesticide is in a venison it's like what (laughs) venison did they test you know and the bigger thing is how old is the deer so if you shot a yearling versus you shot a two-year-old versus you're the you're that awesome like like one thing i want to talk about here in a minute is i'm like not a great hunter you know and i i don't i'm not actually invested in becoming a great hunter so i'll explain what i'm talking about in a minute but if you're somebody who's like, I'm, I always get the 200 pound plus main buck every year, who's seven or eight years old, man, the pesticide load in an eight year old buck versus in a yearling, that's bioaccumulation. So you have so much more time. So the fact that that cow is 18 months old, maybe your deer is only 18 months old and your deer is way leaner. So that piece of venison has no fat on it. Right, so it's like pure red. It looks like tuna almost. You get that tested, maybe there's almost nothing. But what about the bones of a 14 year old bear? Mm. What's in there? You know, for like let's say cadmium from the fallout from our logging industry and paper mills. How, you know, so it's it depends. It's not like going to be uniform. Yeah. So hard to say, man. I think what's nice about eating the venison is like. First of all, it's way more badass. <laughs> <laughs> it's way more fun to cook. It's darker. It's richer. It's more flavor. I love that. You cook a piece of, like the last time I had beef was when Tony was up here and he cooked in our hotel room. We bought some steaks. Yeah. And I'm sitting there like, oh, I couldn't believe how fatty the meat was. Mm-hmm. 
that marbling and all that fat that's in there, I'm not used to that because of eating game meat. It's, it's like became aware to me, oh man, this is why people think meat's bad for you. It's like so much fat. And I, I think fat's great for you. I'm not like one of those people who thinks fat's bad. It's just, that's a lot of calories. Fat's got nine calories per gram. So you start eating like that all the time, your caloric intake goes up. And there's a reason that people who like beer, steak, and potatoes every day look how they look. There's a reason they're shaped like those ancient goddess statues. That's a lot of fat. That's a lot of calories, you know, plus the alcohol is seven calories a gram. That's a lot. You're talking about a lot of calories. So when you eat leaner meats, you know, you're, get, you're getting less calories per day. So I, you know, that's pretty apparent. Now, when you're eating fattier meat, but it's an 18 year, month year old animal raised on pasture, at least that fat's probably not got a lot of bioaccumulation of toxins. But if it's a bear that's been eating out of dumpsters a couple times a year and it like goes into cornfields and lays down and eats in there all the time and it's rolling around in pesticides and he's 15 years old, it's a tough call, man. It, you, it's, it'd be interesting to actually get this stuff to see some research done. But I was very startled by the research on freshwater fish. I mean, not that, like I didn't think that was a Something else, that came out recently? Something that got sent my way recently. Yeah, I, saw, I, saw. I didn't even start hearing the term forever chemical until pretty recently. The forever chemicals that I heard recently was about a year ago in Maine, a bunch of farms got pretty much shut down because there may or may not be forever chemicals in their soil from back in the day. That's how they would uh, fertilize their fields. And they, they would shut take, down the... It was like spent uh, sewage wow. that was... Um, Something was done to the sewage that turned it into a fertilizer, and they put it on their fields. And then now those that soil being tested, you can. I don't know what the chemicals are, but it's something that doesn't break down for yeah. a long, long, long time. Well, that actually brings a whole other set of concerns that I have because okay, so let's say you arrived at the conclusion like, well, based on all of this, I want to eat from small organic farms. I'm not convinced those are going to be around. I mean, that's really hard. The number of people I've known who've gone into farming versus the number that are still doing it. Like the person who's our farmer, she's so, not easy. She's so dedicated. It's so it's her. But I met her through another couple that were farming organically who I mean, they've lasted like three years. Mm -hmm. And they're like, This is just too much. It's too backbreaking. Like they don't but but the person who who we work with, she's dedicated to it. But when you look at the trend in farming where food production has gone beyond industrial, it's computerized at this point, it's, you're talking about the, the size of the farms and the kinds of equipment needed, the types of seeds being planted and the pesticide and fertilizer requirements. And then you start to look at like who's buying the farmland and what's happening outside the US that is a template for what farming is gonna be like here. Uh, you look at what's happening in Canada. You look at what's happening to the Dutch farmers. Um, I'm not convinced, like, you know, the access to these, like, pastured cows raised on small farms will always be a thing either. So um, I don't know. Like, I think the knowing how to farm like that is as important as knowing how to hunt. Not that everybody needs to know both. I don't mean that. It's just, like, in the way that I think it's valuable for somebody like you or me who has this interest to learn how to hunt and gather for folks who have the interest in farming, like that's really important knowledge that's could be lost f rapidly um, to this new industrial scale model. So <clears throat> how long as we start seeing it? livestock in v buildings, vertical, you know, like vertical farms. Yeah, I think you will, but there'll be crickets and grasshoppers, mm -hmm. you know, cause that can be done like that. Cause you can't vertically raise cows. Like, What's a cow weigh? 1,200 pounds? Yeah. Probably? How many of those are you going to put on a floor? Par with, with other ones under parking it. garages. Yeah, exactly. We were just talking about that the it's other like, day. Like, yeah, raise them like you do a parking garage. Yeah, okay. All right, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But uh, yeah, I think that what we're... I'm, the, the food system long term, oh man, barring a radical shift in human consciousness, right? Like that's also possible. So I want to leave room for radical shifts in consciousness to happen. What's confusing right now is what's underway looks like a radical shift in consciousness because the, it's like, I remember when my bank switched to all green colors 
And I was like, oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> or like when BP, after the oil spill, they shifted to all that green Lotus logo yeah, that they yeah, do, right? Yeah. So they took like new age spiritual logo and the colors of the environmental movement mm -hmm. to greenify that they had just done one of the worst environmental pollution acts in human history, right? It worked. It worked. So we are hearing the language that we want to hear, but it's actually, what's actually being implemented is more of like a top-down control panopticon under the guise of being a nature movement. So it's confusing because it sounds right. We're going to decarbonize, right? We're going to go organic. Like it all sounds really good, but when you look at who's implementing it, how they're implementing it, and how they actually live, it's fascinating. Mm. You know, it's fascinating. But anyway, my, my point is uh, the future of human diet is not, I don't think it's like, um, it's not a given that healthy food will be this accessible and we, and that people will even understand anymore. That's why it's so important that people keep these things alive, you know? You know how Kendall made that, was baking bread recently? We uh, were in the mood for sandwiches. So you can use that bread. And I went, I was like, oh, I want to get some corned beef. I haven't had a corned beef sandwich forever. I got home and I realized I had bought Beyond Meat corned beef. You're joking. <laughs> no way. You didn't notice? You're just in the, the deli on. section, you know? Was it exp it must have been expensive? Well, I beef's expensive. I don't remember. Too, right? but it's just really oh, I funny. love this story. It was, but, uh, when were you going to tell me this? I just forgot. I might, I might have to tell you right away. But uh, the ingredients were mostly just like wheat and stuff like that. Wheat and yeah, soy. Yeah. and It wasn't like anything... I'm sure there. I didn't like look at the whole. I didn't. I was just like, I don't want to eat this. Yeah, so but uh, it was mostly yeah, wheat, soy, and I'm sure some like seed oils and stuff. Avani and I on the flight back from Honolulu after our vacation. You know, it's like a long flight, so they serve food. You know, so uh, like a hot meal, mm -hmm. and I just hear the the carts like way down the aisle, you know, but I can just hear them. They're like, we have chicken and a beyond meat. Offering. Oh really? And just everybody's like chicken, <laughs> chicken, like everybody's <laughs> saying chicken. No one wants to eat that shit. You know, yeah. so funny to me. It tasted horrible. Um, I want to talk about this other thing too. It's kind of a shift in direction, but, um, Hank Shaw put out a post this week. Um, and I don't typically follow his stuff very closely, but like I saw it was the, the post, the image was a picture of the um, Vias for Vendetta mask. What's that called? The You know what I'm talking about? I know the mask that you're talking about. I can't think of what it's... Uh, oh, it's not... I want to say Guy... Jolly. Yeah, Guy Fox. Guy maybe? Fieri. Guy, no. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the bleach blonde spiky hair. Uh, anyway, yeah. So it was that, that mask from Vias for Vendetta. And I was like, oh, I wonder what he's writing about. It's like so outside his normal thing. Yeah. And the post was something about taking off masks or something like that. Huh. I'm butchering it, but something like that. So I go to his, he's like link in the description. So I go to it and he's written this piece, which I found really, I just thought was awesome. He was talking about how he's always felt kind of like an outside, again, I'm paraphrasing Hank, so I don't, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but essentially how I read it was, I've always felt like an outsider, even though I'm in this culture of hunting and fishing and being, he's like, to be honest, like I always question, am I really a chef? Like I worked as like a sous chef. Am I really a chef? Like everyone thinks of me as this wild food chef. It's like, but I don't really necessarily feel like I really am. Or like, like it's the imposter thing, you know, the imposter syndrome. He's like, I'm not, he's like, I don't care about antlers. I don't care about trophies. I don't hunt for the same reasons other people do. I didn't get into it for the same reasons, but I'm always interacting with hunters. So I have this mask that I wear when I'm around them and this voice that I use to try to sound like I'm one of these people. Or he's like, I have this crusty New Englander thing that I do when I'm around fishermen. So that they'll think I'm one of them, but honestly, I don't really know much about what I, you know, and I, that's how I just really related to that because doing this show, both the TV show and the podcast, one of the things that's come up for me is like, I just don't, I am just not like most of the people that I'm now. What's been cool about this show is I've gotten so much kinship and, and such positive response from other people who are like, Oh, I'm, I feel like you, like when I hear what you're talking about, I really relate to that. So I know, I don't mean like, poor me, I'm all alone and the only one who feels like this, but I just mean like largely 
when I go into Cabela's, I'm not one of those people I see in their shopping. Like I don't have the priorities. I don't look at it the same way. I didn't get into it for the same reasons. When I shoot a deer and other people are like, kind of small, ain't it? It's like, yeah, I don't care. Like I, I'm not into, and I think this really became obvious to me when we were setting up episodes last year, because some of the people we were talking to about setting up episodes with, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not one of the kind of hunters this person is. Like they'd suggest ideas for episodes that we could do. And I'd be like, I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so cool. I just don't care about that. Especially when it came to like managing lots of tags, applications and wanting to go. Like it wasn't for them about killing this animal and eating it. It was about killing this animal in this location. And I was like, oh, I don't care about that. Adventure hunting? Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to take away from what their thing is. It's just like not what I'm interested in. Yeah. Cause it'd be like, Hey, it's really hard to get into this unit. Mm. And it's like, well, I don't care about that. Like I, I don't, I, I see, I like, I don't care at all about that. Uh, or when it comes to the antler thing or when it comes to the age class of the animal or like, you know, I've got a couple of big bears in my hunting history, which I'm pretty proud of because it's so, it, it is really cool to me mm. because I did it, but I didn't see it set out to do that. Right. So it's kind of like if I uh, if I was into running and I accidentally ran a four minute mile, like I'd be proud of it. Right. But I didn't. It's not my thing. Mm -hmm. So I. But I wouldn't hesitate to brag about it. So like when it comes <laughs> to like the big bears that I have and people are talking shit and showing pictures and like look at the size of this bear. I love. You've seen me do it a hundred times. I love jumping in and be like, well, look at this bear. Yeah. I like to do that because I had that experience. But that wasn't what I was after. That's not what I'm after, and that's not what I put value in really. So. When I'm around the plant people, you know, when I'm around an Arthur Haynes or I'm around a Sam Fair or I'm around um, an Alan Burgo, I'm like, I feel like an imposter. I'm like, man, this is, I love foraging, but I don't have the same, I'm different type of person. Like, Do you think they feel that way? Maybe they do, you know, but that is a really good question. But I recognize that there's something they're into that I'm only peripherally interested in. Yeah. Uh, when I'm around hunting people, same thing. When I'm around anglers, like, um, I'm trying to think of um, somebody who'd be a real, Tony Seacrest. Yeah, I was just going to bring him up. L like, great friend, love this guy, love to fish with him, but his interest in fishing, like, he's always like, dude, you got to come down here and tarp and fish with me. <laughs> and, and I keep every year, I keep going like, yeah, dude, I will, I will. And then I like never do because I'm not an angler. I, what I am is a hunter gatherer. Yeah. Okay. And that's really different than what is meant by being a hunter in the United States. Cause that comes with all this stuff that I'm like, no, nah, I don't, I just can't relate to. And I've actually really been trying over the years, but I've kind of come to a place of like, okay, that's not me. And it's how I feel. I'm sure you've been out fishing with people where you're like, yeah, there I'm, I'm here for the fish, but I don't share the interest that these people oh, yeah. share in it. Um, and I feel that way around a lot of foragers too, though I feel, I think I fit more in the foraging realm, but when I'm around the people who are deep into the botany or mycology, I like to be able to speak that language as a generalist, but, um, man, I'm not, I'm, that's not my particular passion. So over the years, this show has helped me to as much understand what I am as it's also helped me understand what I'm not hmm. and highlighted for me that. And that's part of why we made the show. There isn't really like a home for people who feel this way. Like there isn't a hunting and gathering scene. There's yeah. a foraging scene. There's a hunting yeah, scene. Yeah, there's a, a fishing point. scene. But like there is no, fi like the only hunter gatherers are like actual indigenous groups or cultural groups that do it because they haven't fully modernized into the agricultural lifestyle. But like otherwise, it's not like that's a, the way there's like people who play ultimate frisbee or there's people who downhill ski. There isn't like been a hunting and gathering scene. We've been trying to forge some of that. And we have a lot of allies who feel that way too, that we've connected with many of whom have been guests on the show or podcast. But um, it's been cool to see people's response to our show too. Like we, that was our mission statement was like, let's get hunters into foraging let's get foragers right. into hunting and then when i've heard so many people be like it's so cool how you bring those together and yeah it's like it's so satisfying to and we've had like no no real pushback against no. that either that's been another cool component of it is it hasn't felt like there's any resistance there right in fact i i feel that 
hunters almost universally and one of the things I've noticed too is is hunters sometimes I, I'd get insecure around really good hunters. Again, when I say really good hunter, I mean the kind of person who can go out every year and kill a mature buck. Yep. I don't have that and I'm not going to probably ever develop that because again, it's not my passion. Mm-hmm. But I respect what it takes to do it. Because you have to be like a detective. You know? It's like a, it's like you're a detective and a tracker and a, you've got to understand the mind of that animal. You've got to specialize. That's one of my major issues is I'm not a good specialist. I'm a, I'm a really good generalist, but I'm a terrible specialist. And so uh, I'll only ever get so good at something because I'm not willing to... De- you know, whereas there's so many types of people who dedicate 100%. You know, like think about like Michael Phelps who won like what, like 10 gold medals in swimming. It's like, okay. Yeah. I got right. It. Yep. He probably doesn't know how to do that many other things though. Mm-hmm. Right. Because of like the, I'm sure he knows how to, you know, do his laundry and all that. But I mean like how far can you go in any other thing when you are at that level? So whoever's number one at something's probably not good in a whole bunch of categories. It's the people who are number 10 at something who can be good at 10 different mm-hmm, things because mm-hmm. they're, that's why they aren't at the number one level. Cause the, what it takes to get there, you know? So, um, but one thing I've noticed, so I'd be around hunters and I'll feel insecure cause I haven't done it my whole life. I, because I don't share the same values. And so I'm worried I'm going to be like found out by them or something and all these kind of like whatever kind of insecurity issues come up. But what I've noticed is a lot of hunters feel insecure around us cause they don't know anything about plants and they want to. Mm. or they want to know mushrooms even more than plants Mm -hmm. hunters are always be like yeah i don't know all that plant stuff you guys know you were telling me about the guy what was it at the grocery store the other day that recognized you yeah he was he's (laughs) oh yeah he was saying to me uh well he's a cool guy he was a plumber i worked with actually so we knew each other but then but he didn't know anything about the show and then he went on to watch the show and realized who I was. And then we ran into each other in a supermarket. And he basically said to me, like, he thought it was cool how I pretended to like to eat those plants, <laughs> how, I, how I acted like those plants taste good. He doesn't really like to eat plants or whatever. And I was like, no, I actually like them. I, so I'm not pretending. But anyway, yeah, that's a whole separate thing. But I have found that a lot of hunters want to know how, like, I don't run into, we haven't had the experience of interviewing a lot of foragers where the foragers express insecurity about not knowing how to hunt. Right. I almost, that's, that's infrequent. It happens, but it's infrequent. But hunters, mostly you can tell they do want to know this stuff. They just haven't been exposed to it. Mm -hmm. Um, But regardless, to, to touch back on where we were, I haven't felt pushback from people about what we've been trying to do, which is promote hunting and gathering, which is cool. Um, Cause when it comes to a modern person hunting and gathering, I don't really have like insecurities around that. But right. I start to get them when we're around these specialist anglers, yeah. specialist hunters. And a big part of that is that I, I'm, I just, you know, it's the values and it's the, cause another thing, like I see this all the time when it comes to, particularly when we talk to people in wildlife management, where they have like a, they'll talk a lot about hunting heritage and it's just like, I just don't, I don't, I don't have any of that. I don't care about any of that. Like, well, this is what you know, I love it because my grand- grandpappy, yeah, like we did it with my family, which is awesome. What my family does every year, a hundred percent awesome. I just don't have that, right. so I, I'm like, I can't relate to it in the same way that a lot of people can't relate to why I would want to, you know, eat green leafy plants from nature and they think it wouldn't taste good or whatever. So, um, that's been a big part of it too. I, I just when I'm I've been reflecting back on the experience of making the show, it's like, wow, I, I realize that I. I'm not sure that I've had a home in this scene anywhere except the one that we've carved out. That's cool. And so one of my hopes for the posterity of this show is that it feeds into, you remember, you know, our friends uh, who live uh, here in the summertime who started that hemp shop in town Mm -hmm. and they were all positioned. They, they had this great smoothie shop and in the back they had like a pair cannabis paraphernalia and CBD, but, Cannabis was legal in Maine at that point. I think it had been decriminalized or legalized, but there was no, no one was allowed to sell it yet. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have rec yet. Now we do. And they were positioned and all ready for them. When rec finally opened up, they would be the first shop because they had all their infrastructure in place and everything. They were growers. They had everything set up. But 
the town was so slow in allowing people to do it that they eventually got sick of it, sold the place. Now they live on a sailboat. <laughs> Similarly, I wonder it, cause I've always been like, man, if they had just held out a little bit longer, they would have hit the market just right. Yeah. But they, they got started a little too soon and then they left it early. And I'm wondering like, are we doing that with this podcast? Like in the sense that is there going to be a hunting and gathering scene that develops and we've been part of that early wave, as have other folks like Luke over at uh, Publicly Challenged. You know, he's out there hunting and he's gathering. You know, there's a lot of folks like that, like us doing this now. Like right? we've connected with a lot of these people. And uh, is this something that's going to hit? Or are all these other factors that we've been talking about going to keep it from ever achieving no, the lift I think off. It, I think it personally, I think it's something that's currently hitting right now. Yeah. The show seems to be, the TV show seems to be, I mean, it's been such a huge success because the podcast for us has been pretty niche, right? It's, it's like, it's done well, but it's not done super well because it's not, um, because it's such niche content. There's so few people into it. Whereas yeah. the TV show has got more appeal and it's on a network where, people already have an interest in these it's, things. It's easier because you can help, you can like kind of immerse people into it through the visuals. Right. And, and the deep dives we do on the podcast can be way over people's heads. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, this is just all stuff that I'm, I'm thinking about. I think a, a big thing too, that I've seen in addition to feeling like, um, a little bit outside of a lot of it is the consumer driven aspect around hunting and fishing can be like nauseating for me. Yeah. You know, you go into Cabela's, you're like, oh my God. Like, I remember when I think about it, I always think about this thing that I saw, which was like, um, like a little, uh, caught like a, um, a winch, like a little hand powered winch that you can attach to your tree stand to wind up your backpack. <laughs> you know, like you would go up to the top of your tree stand, you tie a piece of paracord, and you yeah, pull you your pull backpack it up. up, right? It's like the idea that it gets to the stage where you have like a little winch that you use. Where How it's like, heavy is your backpack? Yeah. Yeah. Well, or where it's like, do we need to develop like a specific tool that is manufactured in a sweatshop in China right. for us to have? Like there's this push to commodify everything so much. And one of the pleasures of foraging is that it's uncommodified. Mm -hmm. There, You're not expected. Like if somebody is like, I want to get into hunting. Almost everybody's going to go the same we route. You could almost use more com commodification yeah, we, in the we foraging world. we actually need world. some stuff, yeah. right? But for hunting, it's like, it's hard. It's like you get into it. This happened to me with CrossFit. It's like, okay, I want to start, I start going to a great CrossFit gym. I fall in love with it. Before I know it, I'm buying like knee sleeves and wrist wraps and I need headbands. Rogue is a uh, favorite on your browser now. Yeah, all that <laughs> sticks. Like actually, like I have an open cart there. You know, like you start needing all the stuff. Like I got to have my runners and I got to have my trainers and I got to have my lifting shoes and all. Yeah. Well, I got to have the socks. And before you know it, you got to like buy all this stuff and it's like, it seems like whatever you're into is like that. Yeah. And hunting is definitely like that. And, mm -hmm. and it's a barrier to entry to people because it's so commodified that you're not sure at first, like how much of the stuff you need. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the shows, ours is a, I think is a very pleasant break from a lot of that, but a lot of that stuff makes you feel like you need all that stuff. Yeah. And it's like, man, over the years it's become so obvious to me that animals don't care if I wear camo or not. Mm -hmm. They are not, if I'm not moving, they're not seeing me. They don't care about, and they certainly don't care if my camo is new and they definitely don't care if I'm wearing matching tops and bottoms. <laughs> like they just don't. That's a fashion thing, but, but it's confusing. Do they care if your base like, layer is camo? <laughs> yeah, right. Do they? Every time I get out of my tent in the morning, I'm grateful that my base there is camo because I could be spotted. Yeah, this is definitely a fashion thing. And it's taken me a while to parse out what's important and what's not. I mean, I find like with a camo gun, you lose the it number easier. of times you can't find that thing. You lean it against a tree, you go pee, you turn around, you're like, which tree did I lean it against? You know, like especially happens like at a, an intense scene, like let's say a bear in a tree and you shoot the bear and the bear's down, everybody sets their guns down and then all of a sudden can't find them i mean this stuff is getting crazy you know so i would that is one of the things that i've see i would like to see a shift because another thing is because of the how old the management system is and where it was founded and that what the attitudes towards wildlife were at the time the language that we use is these are resources 
you've noticed that for sure editing the podcast over the years when we talk to wildlife managers they're constantly talking about our resources right they're talking about creatures mm-hmm. you know they call them the resources so there was a time where you could own a human being and that human being was your resource like that's most of human history that's grotesque to us right now i think we're going to look back on this era when we referred to like a 13 year old bear as a resource mm. and it's going to look reprehensible. It's going to be like, there's so many times where I'm reading old books and the language that gets used is so far. Like everybody listening to this figured out by now, I am absolutely not a proponent of woke culture. Mm-hmm. I like can't stand it. Right. And then for people who are like laughing about how do you define woke? It's like, I'm talking about over the top PC culture. You know, when you see it. Yeah. You know, when you see it, <laughs> that said, I only hate it because of the degree to which it's shoved in people's faces and now people's throats. But I mean, it's not like I don't agree with some of it. Right. Right? It's like some of that, some of the things that we used to say as kids that were like normal to say, you could say right in front of your teachers and stuff. Horrible to Today say. would be horrible. Like you would never say. And not just because you can't, because you wouldn't want to, you know? So similarly, I think about the more indigenous perspective of wild animals are our kin versus they are resources. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess I want to leave in the last episode, just sort of having been all over the map with this over the years. And because I tend to, maybe it's like the masks that Hank was talking about. If I'm talking to somebody in wildlife management, I'm not looking to get confrontational with them about the language they use. I want to like learn from them. So I'm not going to be like, hey, uh, when you say resources, don't you think it comes off a little speciest? Right. Like I'm, I'm not like looking to do that. This isn't a confrontational podcast, but I would like to leave again for posterity and just this comment, which is, I would love to see a shift in the hunting world towards a kinship model. Cause that doesn't mean that you can't still kill and eat the animals. It just means you need to be in a relationship with that animal. Mm. And I've tried to do that personally over the years, though I faltered a lot for sure. And sometimes I see things in the TV show where I'll say something that'll be like, Oh, you know, but at the same time, it's, that's real. That's me as a person living in this era. I, I think it's important that we judge people from the past based on their era. Cause it's so obnoxious when we judge them based on our current view of things. And it's like not fair, you know, right. Um, things that people, it's like when you think about, uh, having just read Dan Flory's book, the field of ecology didn't even exist until recently. So the idea that we would judge like what Theodore Roosevelt thought about ecology at a time when like there was a time where the idea of the earth being a sphere wasn't even something in human consciousness. Mm. So to judge people who thought the world was flat for ideas that hadn't been thought of yet, is foolish. You yeah. know? Similarly, I hope history judges our TV show and goes like, Hey, he was doing pretty good for the time. Um, but yeah, there's times where I'm like, I'll be like, Oh, I got one. You know, where you're like, I don't like talking like that about animals, but like, that's real. I did get one yeah. technically, but, but you know, in kinship relationships, I think that's going to be really obvious in the future and right now it's not and i don't know that hunting can ever be accepted by the mainstream without that kind of a shift and so we've had folks be critical recently aj DeRosa made a great point on the show i don't like when people say harvest i've heard ronella say this i don't like when people say harvest because you're softening what's really going on you're killing it's like yeah but man that language is off-putting to people and it can be off-putting to me and I know that I'm killing. I don't need to, I mean, I know that I walk over and I get the blood on my hands. Like I know, but wh- I don't say it cause I'm trying to s- hide that I'm killing. I say it because I'm talking about a kindred creature and I'm in relationship with that species. And I try to approach it as if I have a kind of spiritual permission from that species to harvest from it. And that's why I say it like that. And for anyone who says that, it's like, well, then why don't we say I killed that plant? We say we harvested the plant. Nobody gets weird about that because we don't think of plants as animate, but they are. So I'm, I hope that in posterity, some of this show helps people to broaden their perspective of inter, interspecies, interrelational kinship. I mean, I just think that's so important to how human beings relate to the planet moving forward. So we won't end up on Mars or something. <laughs> uh, in the, in the next podcast, we're going <laughs> to examine how foraging on Mars will be <laughs> <laughs> foraging for red rocks on Mars. Um, well, okay. So I think actually that is my kind of concluding point. I have a couple other things I want to say, but 
I kind of like to end it on that note. Um, I, I hope that, that this podcast has inspired people to have a deeper relationship to living creatures Mm. and that we, that we don't need to have, that there's not a, it's not mutually exclusive that you have kinship with something and that you kill and eat it. I, I, and initially to the modern person who's removed from the origins of food, those would seem to be in opposition to each other, but I don't think they need to be. They certainly weren't through the last 3 million years of human evolution. It's only recently that we've taken on this view of living things as resources. And it's not been the whole world that took that view on. It was just a specific, mostly European view. So, um, I think that that is going to shift. It is shifting, but, um, I hope that it can shift and that hunting can still exist. Um, all right. So concluding things, I want to say, um, you and I are planning to start a new podcast, but we don't have like a definitive, like we're starting it on this date. So we're going to take a little downtime. We're going to start filming season four of the TV show, which I'm very excited about the episodes we have lining up. Me too. Um, And, uh, I want to take a little time to plan out the future of how we're going to do it. Um, and put the things in place that we need to, so that, you know, it's a sustainable thing. So, um, please stay tuned either, uh, you know, to Wild Fed's social media um, or uh, to our newsletter uh, subscription, um, which we're not going to keep sending out newsletters right now, so you wouldn't get anything unless we were starting something new. Um, or to, to my social media, Daniel Vitalis, personally, and um, that way you'll know when we launch. And the TV show, of course. Yeah. Can you say that? Yeah, so like, please keep uh, following the, along the TV show journey. Um, and as always, I know this has been a little confusing because a lot of people don't have access to cable, so there's been like a, how can I watch the show? And uh, I don't have cable, so I watch the show, uh, and I believe you do the same, Grant, through the app Friendly TV. F-R-N-D-L-Y. Yeah. There's no vowel, so it's the word friendly with no vowels unless you consider why a vowel, because sometimes it is. That's how, that's how you'd watch it live if you want to watch the, the first two seasons, yeah, so, and soon the third season. You can watch it on Outdoor Channel streaming platform called My Outdoor TV. Correct. So My Outdoor TV or MOTV.com yep. is My Outdoors, or sorry, is Outdoor Channel's kind of version of a Netflix type streaming yeah. platform. So all of their content's on there, and season one and two of the show are on there. And probably in about eight months or so, season three season will, be, three on will be on there. So you could get a subscription there and watch all the episodes there. Um, but while the show is playing, having friendly TV is like having cable, but it's like it's live. 15 or 20 channels. So yeah. the show airs 7.30 p.m. on Monday nights. Um, and right now new episodes are still premiering, but then they run it a bunch of times through the week. So yep. if you go to friendly, you can get a free subscription for a week and um, you'll be able to just go to Outdoor Channel on there and see what their airing schedule is right. and catch episodes there as well. Um, the other thing I just want to say is a big thank you to everybody who's supported us yeah. through all of this, who's been listening to this show. Thank you. Thank you for people who've gone to our website, bought t-shirts, bought hoodies, bought hats, bought stickers. By the way, we've got some awesome stuff still there. So um, feel free to go over to the website and pick some stuff up. And um, just want to say thank you. It's been a really awesome, it's been an awesome experience. It really has. Yeah. And so in like a, for you and me, it's been like going to college yeah, and like getting a master's degree, you know, minus the, is it a uh, thesis you do in your master's program? A do- uh, doctorate and a, you do a dissertation. Which one is it? I don't know. It's like a, <laughs> I only, I only yeah, did a bachelor's. Anyway, whatever we did here was minus master's minus the whatever paper you have to write. Um, a pretty deep dive for us. So thank you for supporting us as in following along on this journey. Um, we are excited for what you do with what you've learned here. Mm. And I know you've learned from a lot of other folks too. It's not like it's just been us, but, but excited for what you go on to do with it. Um, as we were just talking about what, why we make the TV show and why we made this podcast is to create a niche of modern day hunting and gathering as its own standalone thing from what's been perceived as hunting and fishing in the past. And, um, we want, we want to not only support that, but feed that. So um, we're excited for what you're going to do with that too. So thanks for um, walking through this journey with us and making this possible. Uh, Cause it's been uh, one of the most awesome experiences of my life really to get to do this. And thank you, Daniel, oh. for putting out all the content. Great. Cause I think me and a lot of other people have benefited a lot from it. So, oh, well you're like the unsung hero though. Like, you know, 
I got to listen twice. You, yeah. <laughs> I spent yeah. a lot of time with Daniel. <laughs> yeah. You spent a lot of time looking at me and listening to me. I know. I think about that all the time, Grant. Like well, how, how like I'll call you up and be, or I'll be a couple days since we've hung out. I'll be like, why doesn't Grant want to hang out? Because like, he's been watching and he's been editing your face for the last 16 hours straight. And he hasn't slept, you know? But uh, yeah, thank you for all you've done because you've edited every episode. You've yeah. gone on endless drives and flights. You've it's been super you've fun. sat down and not said a word while me and somebody else have conversations for hours at a length, you know, at, mm-hmm. t- at a time. And um, you've just been awesome. You've been consistent. You've been professional. You've been um, amazing to work with. And Thanks, I'm man. looking forward to what we do next. I think, it'll me too. Be, um, you know, the goal will be a show that's more... Um, diverse more general yeah, and, and still include stuff like this too oh absolutely you know? yeah yeah this is obviously i have a deep passion for this yeah. i'm just excited to um share the rest of my passions equally too um and and not be in a in a niche where um some of the things i'm excited about get sidelined so um so it'll be fun to kind of remove all those walls yeah. and uh it'll be like a coming out party <laughs> for daniel <Italis. laughs> so yeah thank you so much for your support you guys have been amazing and um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us on social media and uh, know that we're still um, passionately making the TV show so if you have episode ideas feedback content concepts anything like that um, reach out to us at info at wild-fed.com our uh, friend Mark is uh, going to be taking over that inbox and so uh, and working with us on that so um, we can still be reached there so um, any final thoughts I think we got it all Great. It's been awesome podcasting with you, G. You too, man.